Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, I'm going to jump right into things because we have a really packed agenda. We have a lot of good speakers, a lot of good panels. Um, just to introduce myself and get some housekeeping out of the way, my name is Jennifer Van Dale. Um, I work at Eversheds, which is an international law firm, and I'm a partner there and I head the labor and employment practice. So I work with HR frequently. Um, quick note about AmCham. Um, if you look around, you'll see that people have different colored badges. People with a red badge are on the board or former, uh, formerly on the board. People with blue badges are AmCham members. Um, there's a few people with yellow badges. They're the people who really get stuff done. They are the committee chairs and they um, drive a lot of what AmCham does. And for those of you who have a gray badge, please feel free to speak to any of us about joining AmCham. It's a fantastic organization and we'd, we'd really um, like to have you. So I'd like to start off um, with a joke because I'm not really a natural public speaker. But um, driving in here this morning, I was thinking about business and about sort of HR and competition. And I thought if there's an old joke where there's two hikers and they're you know, in the woods and there's some hills and they see a bear that's charging down the hill at them. And so the first hiker stops, starts to put on his running shoes. And the second hiker says, are you crazy? You can't outrun a bear. And the first hiker says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. Okay? So it's, it's, uh, it's about where we are, who we're competing with, um, and the markets. And when we were organizing this conference, we were trying to look at the big picture and not focus specifically on HR. And so you'll see that there are a lot of people um, who are speaking today who aren't necessarily HR professionals, but in our view, they're very, very relevant um, to HR. Um, one of the things that um, I was also thinking about um, was, and it seems a bit, perhaps it doesn't fit, but last night I was thinking about Charles Darwin. Um, and about 150 years ago, he wrote his book, The Origin of Species, and he put forward you know, his theory of natural selection and, and evolution. And a few years after that, um, the term survival of the fittest um, became, uh, became known. But Darwin didn't write about the survival of the fittest. What he said is that individuals who aren't suited for their environment are less likely to survive and reproduce. So what we're talking about is adapting. And individuals and companies who adapt will survive and will thrive. So in today's market, everybody talks about disruption, innovation, and so forth. And I, I almost feel like I have to apologize for using disruption in the title, but we started this planning this a long time ago, okay? <laughs> um, it wasn't quite the buzzword back then. Um, but in today's market, when innovation is happening so fast, things are changing so fast, and there's, in certain places, there's genuine disruption happening. How do you survive? How do you thrive? How do you adapt? Well, that's what this conference is here for today, and this is what we're going to be talking about. In a couple minutes, um, we will hear from um, uh, our first keynote, who's going to be talking about um, talent pipeline and sort of long-term um, long planning. We then have two different breakout streams. The first is on disruption, and there are three panels, and you can choose one. And then the second is on untapped assets and how HR can be an untapped asset to help businesses thrive and adapt. Um, after that, we come back for lunch and we'll have our second keynote. Now, all of this would not happen without our sponsors, so I would like to just thank them for a moment. Um, our title sponsor is Stanford American School in Hong Kong, and they've been a real supporter of AmCham um, this year, so we'd really like to thank them. The platinum sponsor is Agile One Hong Kong, the gold sponsor is KPMG. 
We have two bronze sponsors, um, Active Ops and Blue Umbrella. The official Newswire partner is PR Newswire, and our media partner is HR Magazine. So we'd really like to thank them. Okay, now the other thing is there were supposed to be two people doing this, but Sean Ferguson, who chaired the organizing committee, had to travel. So instead of me going down and then someone else coming up, I'm just going to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, so, so Rose is from Hydric and Struggles. She's a partner there in the financial services practice. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, Hydric and Struggles is a leadership advisory firm, and it focuses on leadership consulting, culture shaping, and senior level executive searches. Now, Rose has been in Asia for almost 20 years. She's been in Hong Kong for the past four years. Um, she's originally from Vancouver and um, apparently likes to travel, um, likes to hike, um, has her family here. And I'm going to leave the rest of it to Rose, who can um, talk to us about the talent pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So good morning, everybody. It's great to see you here. Thank you. This is great to see you here so early in the morning. Um, but first of all, before I kick it off, I'd really like to thank the organizers at AmCham for uh, inviting me here to speak today. But most importantly, I'd like to recognize all the hard work that's gone into um, shaping today's agenda. It looks like a truly fabulous day, and I know I've really been looking forward to it. So lucky me, I get to kick it off, and uh, I was asked to speak about preventing a leadership crisis in Asia. It sounds pretty ominous, right? But in other words, how can we future-proof our local leadership pipeline in this rapidly evolving landscape in Asia? But first of all, I'd like to ask you all a question. Is this, is this a question on your organization's agenda? Is it? Great. Well, I hope so. But you might be wondering, so how did this subject even come about for us? So you might know that my colleague Charlie and I wrote an article on this. And it started with a discussion that we were having about the increasing number of conversations that we were having with our clients about their concerns for the lack of depth in their local leadership pipeline. So we've both been in Asia for 20 years, and we thought that these conversations should be getting less and less, not more and more. So we were wondering, what was at the bottom of these concerns? So we decided to write an article and, of course, uh, do all the research that goes with that and share our observations. So, but today, in addition to those themes that came out in the article, what I'd really like to do is share some of the conversations that we had while we were writing the article. Conversations that really resonated with me, and I hope they resonate with you, and I hope you find them interesting. And let me tell you, you're the first audience that has ever heard these conversations and the last audience that ever will. So, uh, so I hope you enjoy them. Thanks. So the clicker, the important clicker. So through today's session, um, I'm going to try to answer three questions, right? So the first question is, what are the three main themes in this rapidly evolving Asian landscape that might be contributing to this leadership crisis? And the second is, what, with these three themes in mind, what qualities are required for today's leaders to succeed in Asia? And the third is, what are the solutions for future-proofing your local leadership pipeline in this region? So let's, uh, let's start with answering the first question. So what are these three main themes, right? The diverse and highly matrix nature of businesses in Asia is the first one. So diverse from a cultural and language perspective, but also from a legal and regulatory perspective especially for those of you in financial services. So as you all know, there's no one Asia, right? And it's often linked together by a highly complex matrixed framework and reporting structure, right? And the second theme is, of course, the internationalization of the local firms, especially the Chinese firms. So as you probably know, the number of Chinese firms on the Fortune 500 list has increased threefold over the last seven years. All of this contributing to the pressure we're seeing in everyone's leadership pipeline, global and local firms, everybody looking for the same tech-savvy, future-relevant, and internationally trained leaders. And then the third theme, right, is that technology is driving mass change. And uh, Jennifer 
alluded to that. And it's driving mass change in three broad ways, right? One is technology is driving change through cost effectiveness programs, through automation, right? It's driving change through the way we interact with our clients, through digitalization. And third, it's driving the makeup of the workforce with the rise of the gig economy. And we're going to be talking about that in one of our panel sessions. So these themes are most probably contributing to this leadership crisis. What do you guys think? Does, does that resonate with you? Yeah. So the next question was, what does this mean for you and for us in terms of how this evolving landscape impacts the attributes needed for leaders to be successful in Asia? So through our conversations and through our own work, we observed six top attributes. I could only write six. So six top attributes for leaders to be successful in the region. Okay, so to better illustrate, I put this into two broad buckets. On one hand, uh, two broad categories that correspond to the themes that I've just spoken about, right? So on one hand, the attributes needed to uh, lead through a highly matrix and diverse environment, right? First, of course, communication. But most importantly, the ability to communicate the local story to global in order to get support for what you need to get done in this region. And the second is the ability to influence and manage stakeholders. So as we all know, in this highly matrixed environment, we have multiple stakeholders and we often don't own the resources that we need to get, to get things done. So we need to influence them. And the third is, of course, we need strategic leaders who can execute on the plan. So many a good plan has fallen down in the execution phase, especially in this very complex, diverse environment in Asia. So that's the first top three attributes to lead in a highly matrixed and diverse environment. And so then the second is, those top three attributes needed to lead through change and into the future. So the first is, and Jennifer talked about it, agility. Right? So what is, but what does agility mean? We all talk about that. So when we talk about agility, we're talking, of course, about cultural and situational agility because of the diverse landscape. But we're talking, more importantly, about four main sub-attributes, right? Adaptability, learning mindset, forward thinking, and resilience. But I think what's really important is when I speak to leaders, they point to resilience is that one attribute that they personally would like to cultivate in order to be able to um, in, order, in order to be able to deal with the multiple stresses of global, regional, and local, right? And of course, we need energizing leaders, and Nick Lai is going to speak about this over lunchtime. We need energizing leaders who empower their people and are talent magnets and work to invest and develop the next layer of leadership. So we'll talk a lot about development today, I think, right? And the third is, given how technology is driving change, we need leaders who are innovative, right? So we're going to talk about innovation as well. Innovative and technology enablers for the relevant business needs, right? So this was the second question. And so these are the attributes needed to be successful, or at least some of them, in this rapidly evolving landscape. But kind of difficult to get in one leader, right? It's a lot. So perhaps, you know, and especially if they haven't expressly been developed, over time. So perhaps this too was contributing in part to this leadership crisis. We thought, what do you think? Does that resonate? So then we've answered two questions. So then one last question remains. What are the solutions for future proofing our local leadership pipeline given this rapidly evolving landscape? and highly developed leader needed to navigate it. So the first solution is, of course, we can develop them. And we can develop them internally, but especially for those attributes that are needed. But here's a couple of telling statistics. So from one report, more than half say their top executives spend only one to 10% of their time on leadership development. And only 49% of companies say that they have a clear development plan 
for developing emerging market leaders. And 59% say their leaders have little or no accountability for developing their next layer of leaders. And one last statistics. Another study found that only 26% of Asia's rising leaders believe that their next layer is ready to step up, compared to 43% in the rest of the world. Hmm, interesting statistics, right? So could this too be contributing to this leadership crisis? Potentially, right? But what can be done to counteract that? So through the conversations we had and, and through our own work, you know, three main themes kept coming up. And one is, of course, a customized leadership development program, but for local leaders, right? Ones that address the real, present, and potential skills gaps, not a copy and paste version from headquarters. And the second, giving people in the region profile to global without mobility, right? Some people, we hear often people in the region aren't very mobile. So we see a lot of clients bringing global roles into the region and regional roles into country in order to give people who are not mobile and are emerging leaders profile. And another way they do that is allowing them to drive global initiatives and projects from Asia, right? So giving them profile without mobility. But the third, of course, is international mobility itself. Right, either long-term or short-term bubble assignments, as GE calls them. So these are also great development tools. But however, many of the best laid international development plans have fallen down at the repatriation stage. Does this uh, resonate? So let me share a conversation with you that I was having with a CEO. His name is Andy. And he's the CEO of a multinational here. He's a local Hong Kong Chinese. And he himself had the chance of an international assignment. But he told me that in his cohort, 95% of those on international assignment at the same time as him did not make it back to Asia with the same firm. 95%. That's astounding, right? So then we were speaking about a particular recent failed high profile repatriation. We were talking about Ben, okay? So Ben, Ben was his star China COO, right? Local Hong Kong, uh, local Chinese. And Ben had a technology background, so he was the ideal successor for the regional COO job, right? Especially given the weight of their business in China and the number of technology initiatives on their corporate agenda. But he wasn't quite ready yet, so they wanted to send him overseas to give him you know, to allow him to develop, right? So through Andy's sponsorship and that of two other global leaders, he was sent to the US on a very complex two-year project role working with the global COO. But during Ben's time in the US, the two global sponsors left the organization. And upon their departure, he wasn't given any other sponsors and he didn't ask for one, no coach was assigned to him or mentor. And to be frank, his boss wasn't really that supportive of his development assignment, right? So when it came time to, to, to give him his performance review, he was assessed just like the rest of his US employees, right? And to be frank, his, uh, his performance reviews were pretty average, right? So when it came time for Ben to come back to the region, Although Andy really wanted to give him the regional COO job because that's what he'd been groomed for, he had no support from the global leaders, given Ben's performance scores. And there were no other obvious roles senior enough for him. So he left the organization and he went to a Chinese fintech player. But not only did he leave, he took his China CIO with him. So of course Andy's devastated. So now he has a huge gap not only in his regional COO succession plan, but in his local China CIO succession plan. And he said to me, unfortunately, the culture of the organization from global was not supporting the efforts in the region. And that was also an issue that he was trying to address by influencing them, right? We all need to influence. And I asked him what, did, what he thought besides that was the best way to support the next local executive on international assignment. And he said two things. He said, one, culturally neutral and situationally sensitive assessments. They could have helped Ben, 
right? Take into account the development nature of an assignment. And the second one was coaching and mentoring throughout the assignment, right? He should have been assigned a coach or, or, or another global sponsor, and he was too far away. You know, and that, when he was speaking about that, that made me think of a piece of research called um, Project Oxygen that was published by Google. Have any of you ever read it? No? So um, this piece of research highlights the need and the desire of coaching. Uh, by internal leaders. So of course Google, being Google, they ran a data-driven study because they wanted to see what their own employees felt made a good leader exceptional. And what they found from this study was the number one attribute cited by their employees was that being a good coach, being a good coach is what made a leader exceptional. So not only external coaching, but leaders as coaches and mentors really make the difference. And, and I think this is so true in all of the people that I talk to. And I wonder, you know, how many of your leaders are coaching their teams and have the skills to do so? So this leads us to solution number two, smart external acquisition strategies. This is where Hydrate can help you. But so as you can see, sometimes even with this development, the internal candidates are just not there. Or they leave unexpectedly like Ben, right? Or a firm is looking for a transformation and they'd like to bring in a perceived change agent, right? So in this case, you need smart external acquisition strategy. So I give you four smart strategies here. So one is, of course, expats and returnees play a role, right? 30% of companies say that 30% of their top 10 roles are taken by expats. So many expats have a long track record of successfully navigating across the diverse Asian region. So this can be a permanent solution, right? But it can also be a smart interim solution. So let me share with you another conversation. So I was speaking to Belinda, Belinda, the head of HR at one international firm, and they had an impending succession issue. And upon the succession planning and assessment exercise, they realized that their next layer of local leadership was just not ready to step up yet. But they did not want them to leave. They wanted to groom them for the top role. So they came up with a very defined plan to bring in seasoned, very seasoned expats, sort of in the later stages of their careers, to come in for a defined two to three year project in order to groom and hand over responsibility to the next layer of leadership, right? In order to close the gap over this three year, two to three year period. And I love this example because it allows them to retain their local leadership and to close the gaps over a period of time. So the second smart strategy, when going external, this is a great time to build your diverse leadership pipeline, right? All types of diversity. But if we focus on gender diversity for a second, because I think it's top of mind for so many people, right? In 30% of organizations in Asia, women make up less than 5% of the top 100 roles. That's a pretty telling statistic. But so to address this, some firms have a very strong results-driven focus on increasing diversity through external acquisition. I don't mean lip service, I mean they actually hire a diverse candidate at the end of the day. And uh, so for every highly visible role that they take out to market, they'll make sure that they hire a diverse candidate into it. So this allows them, and of course in this case there's often gaps, right? There's often gaps. But they actively recognize the gaps and they try to close them, right? Through internal and external coaching. And I love this because it helps them to make their pipeline more diverse at the top through a smart external strategy. So the third is we find that we can no longer look narrowly in one country or one sector industry for the best talent. We have to look across sectors, across industries, globally for the best talent. And the fourth strategy is there's lots of companies that have great and robust uh, strategies around managing their alumni population, right? Try to bring back, like Yahoo calls them boomerang hires, right? 
And, um, and of course, these people are already aligned with your culture, right? They already have stakeholder relationships, so a great, smart external strategy. But what's important to make this strategy smart and successful? Of course, if you're going to bring somebody in for external, you want to make sure that they're aligned with your culture and you've assessed them for future potential. Not only what you need today, but what you need going forward in the future. And the second is transition support. So all of those that were successful, they had transition support. So this brings us to retention and the factors that drive retention, right? And there are three key factors, yeah, uh, that we found from our conversations and from a study that we've done on employer branding. And these factors really echo the solutions for preventing a leadership crisis, right? So one of the key factors is a personalized development program, including providing advancement opportunities, even if they are a stretch. So we've conducted multiple interviews around this in the region, and many local leaders feel that many MNCs just don't provide local candidates with a clear path up the ladder. The second factor is, of course, the quality of leadership. So as the saying goes, people do not quit companies, they quit leaders, right? In the APAC survey that we did, 67% cited senior leadership as one of the reasons they stayed. And in China, that was the number one factor, leadership, the number one factor. The second is, the third is attractive culture. Attractive culture is the top reason in our APAC survey and the second reason in our China survey. The second reason, above a competitive employment offer. So in Asia, this desire for an attractive culture means that we all need to know our value proposition, right? I know that our panelists are going to speak about this later on, about some cool initiatives. But this leads us back to who are our real competitors for talent, right? And what are they offering? So they may not be your traditional competitors. We wrote in a recent article on the talent in China that Alibaba, Baidu, Huawei, Xiaomi, they're all out there and they've made headlines for poaching leaders from their global competitors, right? So this leads us to our next and last solution and the importance of leadership development and culture on the CEO agenda. So many of the conversations we have with senior leaders are of course around culture, right? And as you know, a healthy culture minimizes bad conduct and aligns behavior with strategy and supports accelerated performance. So this can only be driven from the top of an organization and it's especially key in Asia, where you have such diverse cultures, ethical norms and value systems. And this modeling of the culture, of course, needs to come from the top. It needs to come from the CEO and the board and the senior leadership team. And of course, we call this the shadow of the leader. You may have heard this expression. So one last conversation, just to illustrate the importance of focus at the top. So I was speaking to Jim, Jim. And Jim is one of our clients, and he's a CEO in the region. And we were talking about the importance of culture, especially in an organization like his that has such a diverse footprint around the region, from China to India to Cambodia to Vietnam. Very diverse. And we also spoke about his passion for leadership development and his involvement in it. He shared that he felt that the newly joined in-country CEOs were not in line with the underlying culture of the organization, which impacted their ability to deliver, but also their behaviors. Right? But he wanted to assess his in-country CEOs and find where the gaps were. And working with their internal leadership development team, a development program was designed, but he also personally worked with each of the CEOs in country to close those gaps, those skills gaps, the behavior gaps, and the culture gaps. But he also wanted to model the one culture and value that was really important to the organization, which was developing your people. He wanted to show them how important that was. So of course this approach instilled great loyalty in the people and developed highly performing leaders and they were really aligned with the company's values and cultures. But unfortunately when Jim left the organization, when his successor came in, he didn't think it was that important to spend time 
developing his people. So he dismantled the program. He stopped spending time with his in-country CEOs. And now there's a cultural mismatch. So many of the in-country CEOs, when they had a chance to leave, they left and went to join Jim at his new firm. Again, people leave leaders, not companies. And I'm just wondering, is this something that your CEO or chairman does with his people? I'd love to hear about that. So just to wrap it all up, I'd like to summarize what we, thought, what we found out from our conversations and what are important solutions for future-proofing your leadership pipeline in Asia. So one, a customized and relevant local leadership development program. Two, smart strategies for external acquisition. Three, leadership development and culture on the CEO and board agenda. And all of these driving retention. However, beyond those solutions, the one point that was reinforced for me from these conversations was how important the individuals are in achieving success in future-proofing your leadership pipeline in Asia. Leaders like Andy, Jim, and Belinda are all essential in order to make a difference. Thank you. Rose, thank you very much. That was, that was fantastic. Um, thank you. Thanks. Um, so we have about 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. And I will just warn you, if you don't have a question, um, Rose has I questions do. for the audience. <laughs> and I will call on you. Okay. <laughs> so does, does anyone, and, and can I just ask you to stand up, say your name, and to say your organization. And there's a microphone for you. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Petrie from Goldman Sachs. Rose, can you share some more information about cultural neutral and situational sensitive assessments? Very good question. <laughs> so I, that, that is an excellent question. First of all, I'd love to hear in your organization, do you have any culturally neutral or situationally sensitive assessments? I'm not sure. We do absolutely have assessments, but I'm not too sure if they meet that criteria, to be honest. Mm. So, I mean, I think <laughs> they probably do. Um, I mean, I think it really depends on who is actually giving the assessment, right? So in Ben's case, right? So he's on a development assignment, and he's being assessed like the rest of his people, right? So is that situationally sensitive? Not really, right? They're not taking into account the, the development nature of this role. So why would you be assessing the same as you would everybody else in that situation? And basically, they killed his career ch chances for coming back to Asia, right? And the second is, you know, some people have, um, uh, you know, hypo programs, and they, they have, um, uh, you know, assessment centers. And a lot of those assessment centers are conducted in English. And so the best candidates tend to be those who speak English the best. And so are they really culturally neutral? That's just a question. You know, I don't know. I'd love to hear what you think. If I'm honest, I haven't given it a lot of thought, but um, it's definitely given me food for thought to actually look closer into it, to be honest. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh. <laughs> He's going to give you me might a good have one. A, another <laughs> response from Goldman Sachs. <laughs> Paul, Schoen, <clears throat> Paul Schoen from Goldman Sachs. Um, I think um, the question. I have a question. You talk about uh, the cultural neutral assessment. My exp our experience in the firm is there are two things that we actually can't address as yet. One is the notion of presence. There is a lot of talent in Asia. <clears throat> what they're lacking is the, the perceived presence in the eyes of people mm -hmm. sitting 8,000 miles away. They're not, they don't see it mm -hmm. as of someone sit outside the office day to day. They see their physically presence. Mm -hmm. They see them presence on the table, etc. The second thing that we cannot address as yet is the notion of trust circle. Mm -hmm. A lot of the promotion and assessment sometimes is quite subjective. Mm -hmm. What I think of that person's performance mm -hmm in the organization. And that second part probably linked a little bit onto the first thing I talked about. But these are two things that we found we are not yet kind of tackled it. 
with a lot of 100% success yet. So I want to hear your thought on, in your research, whether these two things came up and whether there are any suggestions from you to address these two issues that we're facing. Yeah, but I think, I think you're right. I think that's, that's a really good point. Um, and I don't, I don't know if anyone has the answer, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, but, but you're absolutely right that those are, those are definitely two themes that come up over and over again. Um, but I haven't heard a definitive answer to it. I'll keep thinking. Keep asking. Diana? Hi, Diana David from Financial Times. Um, we do board training. And one of the things that you put up in your slide was the importance of a strong culture. And I was in Manila, we were doing training for the Asia Development Bank Board of Directors, which is really interesting, because it's kind of like one representative from every country, which you don't have in a lot of firms. Um, and we did a lot of intercultural trust training. Um, what do you think is more important, having a really strong corporate culture that you look around and say, look guys, this is our culture, love it or leave it. Um, you know, John Slosser, uh, the chairman of Swire kind of says, everybody knows what they're getting, we just tell them all and if they are up for it, they join. Or do you think it's more important to say, you know what, everybody's different, so it's important for us to make sure that we all understand each other's culture. You know, if you had to choose one, would mm -hmm. it be the multicultural understanding or would it be just have a strong culture, and if nobody likes it, then they can go somewhere else. Mm, that's a really good question. I'd love to hear you, what do you think about that first. <laughs> I don't know. That's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> but but what do you, I mean? Uh, it's a great question. Um, but do you what you know if you were to choose? Um, you know, I think it really depends on the organization. I think one of the, the issues with the organizations today, right, is that there's so much change going on internally. So even if you think you have a really strange culture, or strong culture, strange as well, but strong, it, it could basically walk out the door with some of your senior leaders that, that were really the biggest culture carriers. And, and I could point to a very large bank in Hong Kong that, that you that some people might say that about. Um, so. So what is the best thing? I think that um, I think it all comes down to, at the end of the day, the individuals, right? Individuals are culture carriers, right? In the in in the example of Jim, right? Jim was modeling the the um, the values of the organization, but his predecessor wasn't, right? And or his successor wasn't, I should say. So, yeah. well, and and in fact, when you were telling the story of Jim, the the question that came up into my mind was, so when he left. And, um, you know, presumably the board hire, hired Hydric and Struggles to find his successor. We didn't do that one. No. So we didn't do that <laughs> one, but it's true that cultural alignment would have been the question. Was that guy culturally aligned? To yeah, that? and that, that's, yeah. that's the, uh, because, you know, you're, you're right in this, yeah. you know, sort of this area. And I'm, I'm wondering, do you when, you, when you get a mandate and, you know, to go out, is that something that you're asked to look for? And does everyone do it? Because it seemed like it well, didn't I, happen maybe in, not in, in Jim's case. case. Yeah. <laughs> maybe not in Jim's case. But um, I mean, it's definitely something that we integrate. Hang on. The infinity framework. So it's definitely something that we um, integrate in each one of our assessments, right? So there's sort of four buckets when you mm -hmm. assess someone. And one of them is their cultural impact. Right, and uh, and we, you know, with our as we have a culture shaping piece of our business, we have some pretty robust assessment tools around cultural alignment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. okay, I think we have time for one more, um, two more. Okay, <laughs> so in the back. Um, my name is Fred, and I'm with the University of Hong Kong. I used to work in a human capital solutions organization. And part of what we saw in my previous um, career is that you work with a number of CEOs and who are very focused on you know, P&L and operations, right? And we also advised clients that you need to focus on HR. So Rosemary, from your interactions with the likes of Jim's or the other CEOs, right? What would you recommend to be the percentage of time a CEO should spend on developing his team, um, leadership, other HR activities, 
versus actually just focusing on the P&L and operation? What would make an organization more sustainable? That's, that's a really good question. And one we were thinking about right this morning, actually, is there a percentage of time to spend? I mean, it's interesting. It depends depends who you speak to, but it also, you know, I think it's also a philosophy, right? You know, you are probably developing your leaders, you know, constantly, right? This isn't a, like, we're going to sit down and now have a coaching conversation. This is, oh, I'm meeting you. Oh, did you do that? You know, and, and having and coaching them on the fly. Um, so, you know, it's sort of continuous. So to say there's a percentage is, is sort of difficult. But one person I was speaking to said they spend definitely 50% of their time in, in leadership development type, including um, hiring activities. So uh, I'm not sure if... But so just so, so Nick Lai is going to be mm -hmm. speaking a lot about empowering. And this is, these are the... Th and, uh, these are our 13 drive factors for organizational high performance. I just, uh, no one ever asked the questions of what accelerating performance was, but these are our 13 drive factors. Okay. Can, are you distributing the slides to? Um, we can, you if can? they would okay. like them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, I think the last question. Thank you. Uh, Paul Arkwright from HR Mag. Um, I just wanted to come back to that question that was asked before, because I'm not sure we really addressed that one, because I thought it was very interesting. Um, about whether you should have a leader who really drives a culture through the organization or whether you sort of embrace diversity in a way that allows everybody to be individually expressive. In my mind, I kind of thought, well, you've got to do both. If you don't have a leader driving the culture of the organization, what, what's to stop it becoming a complete chaotic mess with everybody going off in their own directions? So... When you answered, I thought you alluded to the second one and saying, oh, it's better to, to let everybody discover how diverse they are, what particular culture they have. If you went down that avenue, how would you stop that becoming rather chaotic and difficult to manage because people are going off in their own directions? Yeah. No, I, I, I don't, th yeah, I, 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 I hear your point. I, you're right, I think we didn't answer that one very well. But I, I would agree with you, actually, in the first instance. And I, and, but I think we have to embrace diversity, but what does that mean, right? That doesn't mean that we compromise the underlying values and cultures of an organization, right? If we think that one of the cultures that we want to be uh, that, that we want to champion is developing our people, for example, right? So I want to model as the CEO that I'm developing my leaders and I want him to do the same. That doesn't mean that I'm not embracing diversity, but it does mean that I expect them to, to at least um, adhere to these underlying cultures, right? Does that, I, so I think we can do both, but it has to be a balance with the underlying cultures driving it. Right? And again, they come from, I think, individuals. And we can see how quickly a culture in an organization can shift with one individual's departure. Well, <laughs> could, could I, I mean, so I think of the culture as sort of the framework. It, yeah. it's, it's the foundations. Yeah. So, you know, if, uh, well, you know, whatever it is, there's lots of different examples. And you can recognize diversity, mm -hmm. whether diversity of thought or if you look at demographics or whatever, within that. I mean, I, I don't think that, you know, if you have sort of an open door type culture, for example, um, it's not necessarily squashing someone if, uh, you know, they, they just need to be, they can be themselves within a culture. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're squashing them or not recognizing diversity. That's right, and I think if you talk about it, diversity is also authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody feels free that they can come to work as who they really are. It, you know, that's yeah. obviously something that, that most organizations would, would like to encourage, but again, that doesn't compromise, like you say, that underlying framework of what those cultures actually are, yeah. depending on how you define those cultures, I guess. Okay. Um, we're going to have to stop there. At this point, um, we're going to go out and join the breakout sessions. So there's, there's three sessions. They're in some rooms that are kind of down the hall and off to the left. Um, please take your things with you, because the hotel staff is going to break the room down to set it up for lunch. Um, so take everything with you. Um, one, one point I'd just like to, um, to note as you make your choices, if you haven't already, is the Breakout sessions will be filmed, 
and they will be made available later on. So the fact that you have to choose one of three fantastic sessions um, means you can still watch the other two later on. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>